one of the world's most uh, respected computer scientists, Donald Knuth, has said that um, if software patents had been available in the 1960s and 70s when he was doing his work, that it's probably the case that computer science wouldn't be where it is today. Uh, there would be blockades on innovation that could seriously have prevented the kinds of um, technical solutions that we uh, take for granted today. The programmer writing a long program might conceivably need to check whether 500 or 1,000 different techniques are patented, and there's no way that she possibly could. The patent office issues hundreds of software patents all the time. Every Tuesday they issue 3,500 patents, and a large number of those relate to software. It's just impossible to review all those patents every week to make sure you're not doing something that could infringe them. So there's a, um, a provision in the U.S. patent laws that basically holds patent infringers um, at a, I, I guess, imposes greater liability if they're shown to willfully infringe. So basically the idea is that if you knew about a patent and you infringed on it, you should have a stricter penalty than if you didn't know about it. But what this results in is the situation where there's a real disincentive to follow what patents have been made and, and you know, what, what new inventions there have been through the patent system. Because if you read every patent, then, or, or there's evidence to show that you've read patents, then you are liable for willful infringement. Then you knew about the patent and you infringed it anyway, and the penalty is treble damages. Yeah, a number of the um, people who filed briefs in this course suggested that software should be removed from the scope of patentability. Can you comment on that? Yes, well, I obviously disagree with that, and I don't believe that software should ever be removed. It's one of our greatest sources of technical innovation in this country and to come up with a test that would somehow eliminate software would, I think, be a disaster for the economy. You know, Mike, Mike and I estimate that um, outside of pharmaceuticals and chemicals, the patents sort of are, are acting like a 10 or 20 percent tax. Uh, you know, so you, you can think of that, uh, that, you know, the small developer who's developing something, down the road he's going to have to pay that tax. And, and, you know, every small company I know in, in, in software ha a few, you know, as long as they've been around a few years and, and hit the market, uh, somebody is, is uh, asserting a patent against them. They're running into some potential difficulties. They feel, very frequently feel obligated to get patents themselves for defensive purposes. Um, so all of that activity is, is a tax. It's, it's something that's not helping them innovate. Uh, it's, it's, you know, an unnecessary activity. The primary thing we do is uh, an issue tracking system called RT or request tracker. Mm -hmm. So it's customer service, help desk, bug tracking, network operations, anything where you've got a whole bunch of tasks that need to get kept track of um, and you need to know what happened, what didn't happen, who did it, who didn't do it, when. Um, it's kind of like a to-do list f um, steroids f designed for a whole organization. Pretty much everything, everything is open source or free software um, under one license or another. We'll get, you know, we will get consulting customers or support customers who add indemnification language to our, sta to our standard contract or need us to sign theirs and it says that you know, you know in the standard legalese it's going to say something like uh, we indemnify and hold them harmless and agree to pay their legal fees and sacrifice our firstborn if something happens and someone discovers that our software is, um, is violating a patent, is violating somebody else's patent it's very, very rarely the case that we end up signing something that has that kind of language in it, but it eats up a lot of legal fees. Look at the innovative people in software, in ICT, and ask, would they be better off if the patent system was abolished? The answer is probably yes. Who's benefiting? Um, patent lawyers, number one. Uh, Number two, you, you have a small number of so-called trolls uh, who, are, who are benefiting, but it's not clear that even most of them make, are making much money. Uh, you're seeing most, more recently, uh, in the last four or five years, uh, companies like Intellectual Ventures and hedge funds who are acquiring large volumes of these trash patents and using them to extract hundreds of millions of dollars from companies. They're benefiting. They may be the biggest benef beneficiaries. You know, there's a lot of bad press in the last few years about the harm that's caused by software patents, and we think that's had a political influence on the PTO to get them to 
uh, slow down their issuance and start rejecting them. That's what's resulted in the Bilski case. Well, the biggest first bad press story was the BlackBerry patents, where all the congressional representatives have their Blackberries, and there is a company called NTP that sued the manufacturer of Blackberry, saying that all Blackberries infringed its patent. Well, NTP was this company, which is just a one-person holding company. They didn't make any products or services themselves. And so, you know, this got a lot of attention. It was in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. And, and congresspersons were really upset that they may lose their blackberries and they may not be able to communicate efficiently. And so that caused a lot of attention. Then you had all these patents on like banking methods and imaging for checks that those patent holders have been asserting against the banking industry. And the banking industry has a lot of influence on Capitol Hill. And so they've been going down there and saying, look, these types of patents are causing us lots of harm. Then you add into that the whole patent troll phenomenon in the Eastern District of Texas with small patent holders suing large IT companies like Google and Microsoft and uh, IBM and Hewlett Packard and all these companies also have legislative influence and they've said you know these types of patents are causing real harm to our business they're costing us jobs they're increasing the price of products and services that we offer to our customers and you need to do something about it the, the the situation we find ourselves in is that the, the lower court, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, is essentially a court for patents, for here in patent cases. And this is the first time that the Supreme Court has um, taken up uh, that scope of patentability. And specifically, this, this test that was implemented by the lower court does talk to software patents. And so there's basically a 20-year history of software patents being granted due to the, the, the lower court. And so we are hoping that the Supreme Court will clear up the mess that the lower court's created and re-stamp its authority, which basically said that you cannot have software patents. When you saw the arguments that were brought by Bilski's lawyer, uh, the patent bar is, in some sense, an organized lobby and a uh, expansive subject matter that's available to be patented is in their interests. Um, and it's clear that that was frustrating to some of the justices. Some of them were frustrated by how expansive patentable subject matter has become. I mean, they seem, they seem, they they seem somewhat dismissive of the idea that you could patent this particular idea. I think that people have a hard time getting over the idea that you could get a patent on hedging commodity risk. But if you actually look at the claims and look what's in there, it is a process and it's no different than any other process. It just may be that it's not the way that they've thought of patent law in the past. We were encouraged by, by the comments by the justices which, which showed that they were skeptical and which suggested that they understood that software is little more than a series of steps uh, that could be written out as a mathematical formula or written out on a piece of paper or as was mentioned by one of the justices, typed out on a typewriter. Software patents on a general purpose computer have never been explicitly endorsed by this court. And this court has also shown no compunction about reversing rules that have held for a very long time. They clearly thought that the petitioners here were trying to get a patent on something very basic, some basic forms of human activity. 